Welcome to the Acorn Energy Co-op Energy Educational Program, Weatherizing Your Home from Top to Bottom. We'll actually begin with the bottom today, with basements, and do the top at our December program. I'm Elizabeth Golden Pigeon, the program manager. This two-part program provides expert advice on how to protect the health and safety of your home through weatherization with particular emphasis on your basement this evening and your attic at the next meeting. Tonight's program will begin with an introduction to indoor air movement, heat loss, and how you can protect the health and safety of your indoor environment. The focus will be on basement insulation systems and dealing with moisture problems in your home. The December 8th presentation will focus on attic insulation systems and how they impact the health and safety of residential living areas. Our programs are presented by Fred Lugano, a local weatherization expert and author, and many of his articles are in the handout this evening. Mr. Lugano has many years of experience designing and installing weatherization systems and correcting faulty systems installed by others. He will clarify the misconceptions about moisture, airflow, and indoor air quality and explain the proper way to weatherize your home to provide a safe and comfortable living environment. Our programs are sponsored by the Addison County Regional Planning Commission and the Addison County Green Fund. The entire energy program series has been organized by the Acorn Renewable Energy Co-op. It's a member-owned cooperative serving residences and businesses in Addison, Rutland, and Chittenden counties. I know that some of you are members. The co-op provides education, outreach, services, and products that help members take steps to make the transition from our present reliance on fossil fuels to greater use of renewables and local solutions. We have membership applications in the foyer if you're interested, or you can go online to www.acornenergycoop.com or call us at 802-385-1911. So now we're going to introduce our speaker. Let's welcome Fred Lugano. Hi. Thank you. It's wonderful to be with you. And even better to talk about cellars tonight because it's one of my favorite things. To do this, um, we're going, I'm going to try to see if you can learn about weatherization the way I learned about weatherization. So I'm going to tell you some stories and take you to my clients and we'll look at their houses the way I had to look at them and solve the problems the way we had to solve them to help them. And also we've got all kinds of these little cheesy demonstrations along the way and try to have some fun with that. But the, my point here is that we can't bring real building components into this room, so we're going to use models. This is a house, and that's another model of a house. And I'll ask you to kind of suspend your disbelief and travel in your mind into these kinds of environments. <clears throat> the attic and the cellar, the two most interesting places of a house ever. It doesn't matter whether it's a little cellar, what we might call a crawl space, or a full basement, I'm gonna call them cellars. And that's a point, for, for about a half hour in this, uh, in this talk, we're gonna be on this page. And we're going to come to grips with the jargon and so we can talk the same talk and think about the same ideas. For the next hour, we'll be on this page and I'll be showing you what to do about all these problems. So bear with me. This is an essential way to try to get to understand a person who spent way, way, way too much time in subterranean areas. <laughs> it, it does affect your mind. Um, as Elizabeth said, this is the next program. This is tonight's program. We're going to try, you know, to cut it in half, and that has a pitfall. And here's the reason why it's a pitfall. You can't really do it, ever. The whole house is connected together. If you open 
and add a catch here, the furnace flue that might lead to a chimney here will see the pressure wave from that measure instantly here, just as though it was connected with a chain. The pressure front moves at hundreds of miles an hour. So for our purposes, they happen at the same time. And I don't want you to ever, ever think that you can walk out of a talk like this on sellers and think you know all there is to know about sellers. Because this is just an extension of the attic. And until you learn about the attic too, you're going to get an incomplete picture of what's going on down here. That's my first warning. Second warning is that we're all here because we're interested in energy. I am an energy nut. But I was fortunate to fall in amongst some people who had a few mind-expanding ideas for me. So I went from going to try to fix energy problems to a whole new set of priorities. Elizabeth alluded to some of them. The prime directive for any contractor, don't kill your client. So whatever you do, safety is the first priority. You always want to make the house safer, no matter whether you're going to install kitchen cabinets or anything. Always make the house safer, no matter what you do. Because if death is bad, quick death is the worst. So what's the second worst thing? Slow death. You want to make the house healthier to live in. Because if you don't, well, if you live there, you're going to die slowly. And if you did the work, it's going to come out of your hide. There's no escape from this. All right? So let's move along now. What's, what's worse than death, or what's next to worse than death? Killing the house itself. You don't want it to burn or rot or fall to pieces. Whatever you do to a house, it's got to be more durable when you get done doing it. What else should we be doing? Well, maybe we should make the house more comfortable, which is another way of saying more useful to the occupants. I'm going to call that utility. Does anybody know somebody who has to close off a room or maybe a whole floor during the winter? I, I saw it all the time in my business. And it's a damn shame because the people are paying insurance on that space. They're paying real estate taxes on that space, a mortgage on that space, and they don't get to use it for a Vermont winter? That's not right. What does that mean? We have to build more space because they can't use the old? When you work on a house, it should be more useful, more comfortable, and work better when you get done. Now, here's the happy news. If you should ever meet a weatherization guy who gives you some advice on how to do these things, the house automatically gets more energy efficient as a byproduct of doing these things. I can't tell you in the brief amount of time we have together the full implications of that philosophy. But I have spent many, many years amongst people who, who have spent lifetimes developing this. It's, it's much more important than I can ever express to you tonight. But this is the thing. No matter what we do to save energy, it's always going to make a house more toxic to live in. 
It doesn't even matter if that action is simply turning down the thermostat so the house is colder. That still makes the house more toxic to live in. When we insulate, when we air seal, every stinking thing we do, including not turning on lights, makes the inside of the house more toxic. And in a minute, I'll prove that to you. But the point is, we don't want to throw up our hands and say, well, do we live in sick houses or do we live in energy opulent houses? And the reason I jumped into weatherization with both feet was that it provided a break in that dichotomy. It gave me a chance to offer people a third path. And that's what I'm going to share with you tonight. Probably not so strange to think about, this path begins in the cellar. And for very important reasons. The cellar, unfortunately, is both the main air inlet to every building, including this one. And it is also the source of most of the pollutants in the building. Honestly, in my own home, if I was going to do this again, I'd just cut the stinking thing out. <laughs> I'd build on top of the ground. Um, but, you know, you can't go to a client and say, well, we'll just back up a concrete truck and <laughs> fill it with cement. Um, I couldn't do business on that basis. So we try to figure these things out. Now, one of the stories I'm going to tell you is about a job I bid in West Addison to do a town building that, that they couldn't barely afford to heat. And while I was defending my bid, one of the selectmen said to me, you can't even insulate an old building. He was trying to get my goat. And I surprised him by agreeing. Don't even try to insulate an old building. It will, it's fraught with peril, ultimately leads to disaster. We've seen this from the 70s. Right now in Australia, they tried it, and they're burning down thousands of houses from insulation. It is not something you want to get involved in. You take an old house, and you modernize it. You fix the plumbing and the wiring and the chimneys and all the structural problems and the poison problems and the moisture problems and the durability and service and roofing problems. And when you get all that done, now you have a modern building. And it's suitable to be insulated. And that insulation will do its job profitably for decades, if not centuries, and the building will remain sound and the people inside will be healthy. That's what we want. I'm not in the business, and nobody ever should be, of trucking out insulation. The point is to improve people's lives. You can't do that by stuffing insulation into old buildings. You want to work on modern buildings. And until you get there, you can only be thinking about this stuff. Uh, I can't emphasize that too much. I mean, people really, really get sick and die. And you're going to meet some of these people tonight in my stories. All right. Um, I told you about that. I told you this is half of what's going on. And I'm going to just take a couple of minutes to explain this linkage. When we heat a building in the winter, the air inside becomes buoyant, and it applies hundreds of pounds of lift to the ceiling. If there's holes like this, the air scoots right through. But there's not an infinite supply of air in the building. So the first thing that happens is it develops negative pressure inside with respect to the outdoors. It's a partial vacuum. You can't sense this with your body, but it's very real, and we measure it all the time with sensitive instruments. As it turns out, the pressure is 
greatest down in the cellar. The lower the building you go, the higher the pressure differential across the building is. And that's the reason why the cellar is always the source of our breathing air. Unless you have a wide open window that's going to short circuit the th millions of cracks in this area, that's where your breathing air is coming from. So when you look at your cellar and you say, do I want to breathe that every minute of every day, morning, noon, and night? Because that's where your air is coming from. All right? Now, a lot of other gases are moving through the building at the same time. You got water vapor down here. Um, soil gases. If there's a fuel storage tank or paint storage, you got petroleum fumes that are come down there. And it gets worse from there. When things go very badly wrong, and we're gonna, we're gonna, you're gonna understand this thoroughly before I'm done, if you try to air seal this area before you work on the attic, you're likely to backdraft your, your heater, and the next gas you're gonna be treated to are combustion gases, because the chimney will backdraft. If, I'm gonna say it again, if you attempt to seal your basement before you treat an attic, you will induce backdrafting. It may not be all the time. It'll probably happen when you're sleeping on a really, really cold, still night. Your basement, maybe it won't flood with carbon monoxide. Maybe it'll flood with carbon dioxide. And then all of a sudden, instead of getting oxygen for your fuel to burn, whether it's pellets or, or, uh, or gas, it's trying to burn those hydrocarbons with what? Carbon dioxide? How's that going to work? Not good at all. Not good at all. So there's the warning. You can get in deep, 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 deadly trouble applying the techniques I'm going to tell you tonight if you don't come to session two. <laughs> all right? We, there were discussions about this. Dividing these things up is dangerous. And the reason it made sense to me in the end is because the start of the weatherization process is cleaning up this area, modernizing the building, doing this stuff, preparing to deliver the very powerful measures that will provide the, the, the propulsion for the payback and the comfort and the utility that thermal measures are supposed to provide, along with the conservation. So here we go. This is a foundation wall. Some of you may not be familiar with these things, so I'll tip them over and you can see them. Now it's as though you were standing <coughs> aside a, a building under construction. And we see lots of these in Vermont. Next step in the construction process. lay down a piece of wood. You can shim it up, level things, nail your floor down to that. It's great. But I have to tell you about the little old lady with bees now. She called me because she had bees. And I went to her house, and I climbed up to the roof. And she was right, of course. All my customers are right, <laughs> at least the ones you're going you're gonna to be introduced to. And she insisted I go downstairs because the bees were coming all the way down the chimney into the cellar. And she didn't want that anymore. When I got down there, I discovered this, this array of moisture mitigation equipment. Her, her walls had been sealed with some kind of gloop. 
She had spent thousands of dollars on dehumidifiers and ionization machines and power venting devices with automatic flappers. And the place still stunk uh, of mold. And there were other signs that, that there was a lot of moisture in the house. The problem was that when these are buried in the ground, they get completely wet inside. And if you can look at the surface area in here, it's at least three times this surface area. So, well, I really want you to get this. That's what you're looking at. Your cellar is surrounded by this massive moisture and mold incubation system. And these holes are designed to deliver it right up into the airspace. Now, is this a passive process? Do these things just sort of like drift along, you know, by Brownian motion and, and, and stray thoughts? No, this is a powered system. It doesn't make any noise. But when this attic isn't fixed, the air keeps leaving, new air keeps in, and it's actually sucking the juices out of these blocks. So what do you do when you have a little old lady with bees? You save your trash bags, your bubble wrap, pretty much any trash you can come up with. And you do that. And the problem is completely fixed. If you're doing this as a craftsman, you turn the bags this way. <laughs> and then you can charge money to do this. <laughs> Costs a lot cheaper than power vents. And the problem is solved. It also illustrates the point. Air quality is related to clutter, surface area. It doesn't matter whether they're bunches of cardboard boxes or carpet or just heaps of old newspapers. More surface area means more indoor air quality problems. Have I convinced you that by stuffing in a, a bag in the top of these cores that we've now cut down the surface area by 75%? Yeah? It's true. I won't lie to you. Um, the point is, we want to do all of our work in weatherization on the envelope. And the envelope is the surfaces we decide upon that separate us from the outdoors. All right? Now, you may have an attic where you want this envelope to go up here. Or you may decide that the envelope is there. It doesn't, it doesn't matter too much. You just have to make a decision. And the, one of the fundamentals of weatherization was just pointing out that people aren't actively making this decision. This is a very simple house. When houses start to get complicated, these facets go all over the place. And the designers and builders don't keep track of them. All right? In a ranch house with a cold attic up there, what happens when they install valences? Well, now you've got a stud wall, and it's all over the place. Mice and raccoons and, and air and, and moisture, bugs and heat. It's just flying willy-nilly through the building. Nobody thinks about these things. And as you can see, what happens is the, the envelope, the real envelope, not the intended or forgot about envelope, but the real envelope, becomes very convoluted. We want to simplify the envelope. And when we're supposed to be talking about the seller. Here's how you do it. Because for our purposes, the seller is indoor space now. If it has, there, there are different thoughts about this, but 
If it has a heater in it, we want it to be indoors. If it's got running water in pipes, it's got to be indoors. There's just no kidding about that. Now, what about the idea of you know, sealing the cellar off from the rest of the house? Well, and I'm going to have to tell you the story about the considerate <coughs> carpenter. This is a gentleman who had a workshop in his cellar. I'll clean this up a little bit so you can see what I'm talking about. And his, his, his wife was allergic to sawdust. And so he thoroughly disconnected his cellar from the house to the point where he had weather stripped the door going downstairs. He sealed all the cracks, the plumbing and everything else. He, did, he just did a masterful job. Here's how he got into trouble. While he was working down there, he wanted to be warm. So the heater's down there, and it's got supply ducts, and it's got return ducts. Well, he figured, you know, what would be the harm in taking a little supply duct and shunting some hot air down there? It worked. But now all of a sudden, <laughs> it's like freezing. And I'm not talking about cold. I'm talking about freezing upstairs. Here's what happened to make this story hopefully understand to you. As he took heated air through here, he created positive pressure in that area. He didn't balance that with a return duct because he didn't want the furnace sucking up that sawdust and making his wife sick. Well, where did that air go? It shot out the foundation. Maybe it went out through some drain pipes. Who knows? But he completely inverted the natural behavior of this house. So now the pressure up here was highly negative. And because he had a house, which was very typical, full of holes, cold air was showering down through everywhere upstairs. In the stairway, you could feel a wave of cold. You could put your body in it and feel a wave of cold air running down the stairs. So if you should ever find yourself in a house with what appears to be inverted temperature stratification, which means it's warm downstairs, cold upstairs, that's not natural. Somebody is monkeying with the physics. And the quickest way to do that is with an air handling system. So don't be like the considerate carpenter. <laughs> now, I want to further illustrate this pressure thing, because I have a sense that some of you are not buying into this. And to do this, we are going to use the pickle jar of science. I ate this whole jar of pickles just for you. <laughs> and you better, you better appreciate it. I mean, I like pickles all right, but you want to you get this? I want to get this. All right. The point is, let me set this up for you. Out here, this is cold. And in here, it's hot. And for our purposes, the cold air, which is more dense, is going to be represented by this water, which is a more dense fluid than air. And the air in this bottle is going to represent heated house air. Remember I told you this is a house. Well, here's what happens if you do weatherization correctly. Now, I punctured this, the bottom of this with holes. Okay, And now this is like heating the house. All right. Can you see there's very there's a little water getting in there, but not a whole lot. That's because the top of the house is sealed. Let me show you what happens if you don't do that. The buoyant air escapes out the top. 
the cold air gets sucked in the bottom. Okay? It's just that simple. Now, this is really as stupid as this looks. It's, it's not a circus trick. That's really how houses behaved. And in fact, if I designed a bottle with a series of holes going up, we could demonstrate that the flow would go in most strongly at the bottom hole, a little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit less, and then we'd reach a point, depending on how far we opened the bottle up, where it would fall to nothing. And then air would start scooting out towards the top. But what happens if we add a chimney to our house? All right. Now, well, let me show you one other thing before we get through with that. Just to emphasize how strongly this works. Let's say that your cellar is wide open. All right? You don't do anything down there at all. It doesn't matter. All right? I'm trying to give you a very powerful lesson that I learned from weatherization people. Do your thermal work up here. Because for every square inch of hole you block, on the top of your envelope, you will get credit for blocking a square inch at the bottom without doing any work. It's free. It's the only free thing in the world. <laughs> All right? It's really, really free. Now, again, to emphasize this, Here's what happens if you don't fix the attic. You get infiltration. You seal the top of the building. No infiltration. I'd like, I, I wish I had more time. I'd like to do that over and over and over again. Um, be, because it's, well, it took me three or four years to learn that. And I, I get really discouraged when people just pick it right up like you are. <laughs> Um, but this is more serious. Now we've introduced a heater into the building, and when it's burning stuff, we want all of that burnt stuff to go out the chimney, every bit of it, every stinking molecule of raw soot, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, sulfates, nitrates, all that junk. We don't want it in our house a bit. So, again, I have to wait till this settles out a little bit. There we go. If the top of the house is sealed, things will work fine. If, on the other hand, you seal your cellar airtight, and you don't do this work that you're going to come to see next month, what's going to happen? You see that? You hear that groan? That's somebody dying. <laughs> Can you see the bottle filling up? What does that represent? Backdraft. Thank you. Yes. You have to understand this. You, I can't let you leave this session without understanding this principle. All right? If you've got a house sucking air, because this natural exhaust system has not been checked, you can't pretend that nothing's going to happen. And if you are getting lots of infiltration from the cellar, well, then you're not going to like that. The mold stink is going to come upstairs. You're going to have like a cold floor here. You might get freezing pipes. Those are all bad things, all right? Durability, 
utility, no good. So the instinct is, ooh, I feel a draft right here. All right, here's my other model. We've all done this. Or there's a pipe running along here. Nice, nice convenient place to put a pipe right next to the sill on a foundation. And it's frozen. And you have to pay a couple hundred bucks for a welder to come out and electrocute it. <laughs> so what do you do? Well, dang, there's the problem, right? No, that's the symptom. This is the problem, but it's really, really hard to find because it's silent, invisible, and not sensible at all. You feel the problem here. So the instinct is to fix the problem here. So you get out with the foam and, and all the other stuff I'll show you, and you just, you just tighten that right up, right? But the, the air keeps leaving the house. And so the, the negative pressure you had down here is even more negative. And this air, it's like trying to get in the house. Trying, trying, trying. And on that one day, when the flue is cold, and your cellar's all warm and heated up, the water will come down the chimney. The, the cold air will come down the chimney. I mix up my metaphors. <laughs> and then your house will be full of combustion byproducts. And maybe, like some of the unfortunate people in Vermont, your children will die. That's no good, right? Remember the prime directive? That's why I put this up here. This, I'm not joking. People die because they fool around in their cellar because that's where they think the problem is. It's not a problem. We did this. I'm going to do it again. Here's what happens if you do no ceiling in your, in your cellar. Nothing. But if the furnace needs air, well, it takes a little air. And then it shoots it out the chimney. That's what we want. I hope that made sense to you. Because <laughs> it's really, really, really important. And I, you know, we may have peaked a little early. That, this is just about the very most important thing I can tell you about sellers. Um, I can be much less dire about everything else. Um, when we seal up a house, it's going to be more toxic. When we keep a house cooler, it's going to be more toxic. When we turn out the light bulbs, it's going to be more toxic. Because whatever junk is in the house is going to stay there longer. All right? Most people's lives are being saved every day because there's a natural flow of air and toxic gases and moisture. These gases come in. They hang around for a little while, and then they leave. Everything we do to be more energy efficient is a process of slowing that down. As we slow down the ventilation rate, whatever toxic materials in the building will accumulate and get more toxic. If you turn the heat off, this rate slows down. And so now you're not just more comfortable, you're less healthy, too. Because sadly, in our universe, when you overheat a house, it induces more ventilation, and you get more fresh air. It stinks, but that's the way it is. And we've got to accept it. And we certainly don't want to make it worse by monkeying around sealing up cellars. Um, 
a very, very bad proposition. I hope I've convinced you of that. Um, and if I haven't, I can tell you the story about the girl who could never go home. <laughs> I got a call on a Christmas Eve at 5 o'clock one year, and people asked me if I could come out to see their house. And I said, sure, right after Christmas. And they said, now could you come tonight? And they said a few things on the phone to me that made me put my boots on and go out in the snow and go to see them. Turned out their daughter had been sick for three years with respiratory infections. And she was getting reactions to the antibiotics. Um, and things were bad. But they didn't believe that it was a problem with the house because her parents were healthy. It was just something about her. And that was the theory. But she went away to college that fall. And she got better. And I thought, well, maybe it's college food, that healthy, healthy stuff builds <laughs> your immune system. <sighs> and so they, they clung to that theory. But when she came home for Christmas and she got instantly sick again, there was no more fooling. It had to be the house. And that's why I had to go to see him Christmas Eve, because that was going to be the only day she was going to be there. Otherwise, she was going to stay with her friends through break. She could not stay in her own house anymore for the rest of her life. And these poor people had no idea. They were convinced now that this was what was happening. The house was killing her, but they just simply could not understand why. And these were highly educated people. Well, as it turned out, they wanted heat in the cellar, too. And there was a laundry facility down there. And coincidentally, the girl's room was on the first floor over the cellar. Well, that doesn't sound like a really dire living situation, does it? Only problem was, next to her room was a bathroom. I'm not sure how to draw a bathroom. That's a toilet, say. <laughs> so here's the heater. With a hot air duct and no return. Big positive pressure down here. Now how, and there's a return duct going up to the floor grate. How does this air get to that return duct, because it's desperately seeking that path. Well, first, it bounced around in the cellar, which was full of the most wicked mold infestation I'd ever seen. Plus, it had a leaky fuel tank and some five-gallon jugs of, of petroleum poison from the 1950s, just full of nasty stuff. Every toxic thing you could think of. And then, when they had the bathroom remodeled, the quickest way to get to the plumbing was through the girl's closet wall. So they punched a hole in there. And they did the plumbing. And they said, now nah, we'll save money, and we won't fix that hole. It's just in the back of a closet anyway. So when I walked her physician father through the air path, out of the furnace, round the mold, up the plumbing chase, into the girl's closet, around her clothes, over her bed, and then back to the hot air return, he almost fell down. He cried. Three years. And then you had this guy walk into your house and in 15 minutes explain to him why he's, they were too cheap to fix the freaking wall and that just about killed their daughter. This is serious, serious business. The, um, the pressures are tiny. We measure them in a unit called a Pascal. To give you some sense of what a Pascal is, if you take a straw into a cup and you suck up an inch of water, you're applying over 200 Pascals of pressure to the straw. 
this girl was getting killed by three pascals of air pressure. Three! You have, you have no chance of detecting this with your body. The velocities are really slow. The temperature gradients are too little. You just can't feel it. You can't see it. But imagine her, her clothing in the closet is like a mold farm now. So not as it, only is she getting dosed eight hours a day with this junk while she's sleeping, then she gets dressed up and wears this stuff venting into her airspace all day. That's how much trouble you can get into monkeying with your cellar. And, you know, I don't even want to talk to you about the people who die, because they do. Um, and there's big lawsuits, and there's lots of tears, and so what can we do? What can we do? Well, simplify the, the envelope, all right? You won't ever get into any harm doing that. Now, this is just, for now, that's just a table. Let's say that you have a dirty crawl space. And by dirty, I mean real dirt. <laughs> Remember, our envelope is what separates us from the outdoors. On this side of the envelope, it's inside. On that side of the envelope, it's outdoors. People like to pretend that the envelope stops at ground level. It does not. This dirt here, I wish I had a brown marker, but I don't. That dirt and that dirt and that dirt too, that's outdoors. We're not troglodytes. The people who tried to be troglodytes gave it up because they got sick all the time. But we still see people who don't think it's necessary to separate themselves from the outdoors at the bottom of their basement. Ooh, thank you. My message to you is don't make that mistake. If you have a dirt cellar or a dirt crawl space floor, Extend the envelope to that area. Then you will stop the migration of vast amounts of water, maybe 20 pounds a day, even in a dry looking crawl space. Soil gases, mold, all that stuff. You don't want it. Here's how you do it. And this is, this is the fun part for me. You can barely get into any trouble, and it's easy, and it's like super effective. The thing we have going for us here is there's no air pressure. Without air pressure, you can do a crummy job and it still works. If you build this part of the envelope to say 90% effective, that means for what, a thousand square feet of a cellar, if you lose 100 square feet, you got 90%. That's a 90% solution to your problem. It's wonderful. In practice, even slopping it in, you can get 97, 98%. If, if you're getting paid to do it, you can get it right up there. And there's two things we use. This is a cross-linked polyethylene sheet. Um, I encourage you to rough it up. You won't believe how tough this is. If you've got a shallow crawl space and it's tough to work in there, you use this because it's light and it's easy to deploy. And that's the end of the thing. There's no reason to spend any money or, or any more effort on it. If you've got cellar surfaces that you want to walk around in, this is no good because a little bit of condensation or drip on there and it's like a piece of soap. You don't ever want to be walking on this. Even, even with the durability issues, 
is no good around furnaces, water, anywhere you ever expect a plumber is going to have to go. Uh-uh. This is what she used. This is roofing. EPDM rubber roofing. Um, happily, it was originally designed for pond liners. <laughs> also happily, it's not filled with junk. Uh, it doesn't exude solvents or stink. So you can use it indoors. Please pass that around. And, and like I said, beat up on it. You'll be impressed. So. It's polyethylene, but it's cross-linked. Um, and that's what makes it rugged. The trade name for it is Too Tough. And unfortunately, that's spelled T-U-T-U-F. I, 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 I hate being a clown. I, how, you know, how do people name their stuff like that? Um, you have to search for it. Uh, uh, a gentleman told me that the last source I was using for it is, is no longer carrying it. So you have to get on the internet and find it. It's worth it. Costs 10, 12 cents a square foot. Yeah. I just have a quick question. Uh, Please. If it's not one solid piece, you have pieces overlapping, so do you, do you find that you have to seal them where they overlap? No, no. The, the, the thing is, if you've got a quiet place that won't be disrupted, like, you know, on a farmhouse addition, you know, that, that other side, they didn't want to dig it out. So there's only, you know, sometimes we got in, there's only like eight inches of space to worm around in there. You don't want to be carrying rubber roofing in that kind of place. That you put that plastic down, and we would roll it and cut it on the lawn so that we could push it out in front of us. We always stay on top. We don't want to hog down in the dirt. So, so where they join, it's not a question of air coming through because there is no air coming through. No, it's just, just keeping the water back there. You've got it. Thank you. That, that's great feedback. That's exactly the point I wanted to make. And if you miss, like, it's like if there's some big boulder from the foundation and it's doing a weird thing, don't worry about it. You cover up 98% of it, you got a 98% solution. I do have one other quick question. Please. When, adding, when you kept referring to sealing it, um, are you talking about a thermal th seal like or air seal? It's an air seal. How do you do that? I mean, in the oh, you got to come back. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? We did everything. I, I can spend a couple of minutes on that. Um, we would get chimney chases we'd see up in the attic that were big enough for Santa Claus to climb down. And I mean, vast, you know four, six, eight square feet. We'd see like cast iron plumbing coming up in, the, in these Victorian homes with a, with a, you know, a four inch uh, pipe and there would be a two foot square chaseway around it right to the cellar. Vast amounts of air come up through these things. And to fix them, uh, we did everything. Uh, when there were big, big holes like that, we'd carry up rolled up sheets of sheet metal because we couldn't get pieces of plywood big enough <laughs> into the space. So we'd pre-cut it, we'd roll it up, ship it in through the attic scuttle, untape it, and it all fall apart. And then we'd snip, snip, snip to make it fit, just, just so. Nail it down, a little caulk, like a submarine. Some places, we'd squirt foam. Uh, <laughs> I'm not bashful about this technique either. Uh-uh. <laughs> um, you know, you can get into a place with balloon framing that'll have 60 holes, like that size. And you, you, you know, you're gonna spend like your whole summer <laughs> doing that. Um, and, and so, you know, you get a wad of something. And in fact, you know what? Let me get back to sellers because I'll insulate this principle to you in the seller context. But the point is you do everything you can. You, you see all kinds of crazy holes. And honest to goodness, that's a, that's a three hour lecture all by itself. Um, the, the only reason I was able to make a success in this business was that for some peculiar reason, I have a wonderful instinct for finding holes in buildings. I, I, like a ferret. 
I could find holes in buildings that nobody could see. And that's what it took, because if the holes are obvious, somebody else would have done it. One, one of my best helpers was telling me, I was really discouraged one day. Everything was going wrong. The house was a mess. Every time we fixed a problem, we'd find two more. And he said, Fred, if the jobs were easy, nobody would call us. And that's what it is. If somebody's got like a, a basketball-sized hole in their bedroom wind, in their bedroom ceiling, they're not going to let that set. The fact is, they could have holes the size of this table in hidden passageways that the last eight owners never knew. They're built in the 1820s, been venting like uh, an air change per hour through the heating system for hundreds of years. And the, the fact is there was no consciousness of this uh, in the pre-war era. It is only very recently that people have recognized that a major portion of the heating load of the house is lost convectively. Early on, scientists were able to measure conduction through surfaces. And engineers and building professionals picked up on this. There was a huge emphasis on commercial insulation. The fact is, it was only much, much, much later in the 1960s where people started to figure out, hey, let's, let's add up the fuel usage. We're shipping thousands of gallons of fuel into the tank. The boiler is burning it at 82% efficiency. We know exactly how much heat is going into this. We look at the envelope and we integrate the conductive surfaces and find the heat flux through all those things, add them up. Oops, it doesn't add up. And it was in Princeton in I think around 1964 when this was done and they said, where's the heat going? So there's conduction, convection, and radiation. And habitable buildings are far too cool for radiation to be a significant factor. So they, they, they were left by the process of elimination to think, oops, maybe it's convection. Maybe we need to develop instrumentation to measure the ventilation rates of these buildings. And from there, it was developed in the 70s when there were government-sponsored insulation programs that did nothing but trouble. They'd, they'd, they'd pour $1,000 worth of insulation into a house and see no effect in the heating bills. So they had to relearn this lesson all over again. Where's the heat going to? We added insulation. It should be nice now. And it wasn't. And the fact is, we had to go back to all these buildings, root under all this insulation to find these giant attic bypasses and pan them over. It's hard to go in through three layers of insulation. <laughs> and lucky me, uh, in, in the late 80s, um, all I had to do was sit still and listen, and this stuff was just spoon-fed to me. That's the only claim I have on it. I promised to keep telling the story uh, if, if those people told it to me. Ma'am. Um, how do you look at radiant heat? It seems like in everything you're saying that if you insulate for radiant heat, you're creating that bad situation. That well, I like radiant about. heat. If In fact, I, I like all forms of hydronic heat. Because we're, this, this, isn't, this isn't just here. We're, we're going we're gonna to be dealing with that. And my message is that, that if you have forced air heating, you have a whole nother raft of reasons to hire somebody like me to fix them. But radi I, I've installed a lot of radiant insulation. I, I'm, I'm one of the few people who likes to put it in ceilings and walls instead of floors. I don't like the idea particularly of putting it in ground contact because the earth is too conductive and, and too big of a, too much of a, I think, goes down through the ground. But it's, it, it's quiet. But if you put it in the ceiling of the basement, mm -hmm. and then you have to insulate that, mm -hmm. 
then aren't you creating that situation that you said wasn't a good situation? Maybe. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. What does the prospect of buying a load of insulation and tossing it out on your lawn sound like to you? Good or bad? Bad. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not, this is, I'm not going to give you a trick question. Let me ask you another question. What would you think about buying a bunch of insulation and tossing it down on your sofa? Bad. Bad. And why is that? Because the principle we have to work on is that in weatherization, we do all of our work on the envelope. We don't fool around in outdoor spaces, and we don't fool around in indoor spaces because we don't want to insulate the inside from the inside. There's not enough temperature gradient to make a difference. So that's why it's kind of a shame to put insulation in a mid-floor. You know what I'd rather do? I'd rather go to the next floor and put radiation in there. Then it can shine down through the ceiling. It can shine up through the floor. Same, same cost of pipe, but I don't have to put in insulation for it because I want the heat to get out. I really, really want the heat. I mean, radiant, one of its big detriments is that the heat flux is low. I mean, you really want that heat to get out of there. But more than that, we, when, when, you, when you work in a competitive environment, if you waste insulation, by applying it between indoor surfaces or between outdoor surfaces, you get clobbered, punished. I mean, it isn't, this isn't a psychological thing. It's money being sucked out of your bank account. <laughs> and so that's just my perspective. Well, we've been told that we need to, that we're just wasting the the heat, because it's just going outside, so therefore we need to insulate the can I can, can I restate that for you? Somebody is telling you, you have radiation above your cellar, and they're saying that the heat, you're losing it into the cellar when what you really want is to be nice and warm up here. Right. And so they're suggesting that you improve the situation by putting insulation there. Yes? And on the of the basement. Yeah. There? Sides. Oh, down, down here. Down. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. I'm going to make you solve your own problem. But I'll give you clues. You know now that the eternal path of air movement is from the cellar up, yes? And you believe me unquestionably about that. So in the scenario where you fail to insulate the cellar and you put heat there, where's the next stop for that heat? <laughs> yeah, right where you want it. <laughs> yeah, And you can't stop it. And if you try, you might destroy your house or make your family sick. But it's really hard. I told you about you know, the considerate carpenter. He's been months doing this. And he's the only one I've ever seen in decades of this that ever actually accomplished this. Most lecturers will tell you it's impossible. I can't say that anymore because I met the one guy who did it. Um, but the point is, let's say, let's, say, like, let's say this. Let's say this would be like, the really dumb insulator. He says there's a problem, so he comes out, and being the dummy that he is, he insulates on top of the floor. You tell me. Is any, in the worst case scenario, doing exactly the opposite of the advice you got. Well, now I'm thinking I should remove all that insulation that's there that isn't as good as people say it should be. I don't know. <laughs> oh, boy. We should address this. 
is a fiberglass. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the thing. You've got to weigh the, the, the problem of having this glunk in your house known to some people as man-made asbestos, but you didn't hear that from me, versus the prospect of tearing it out and creating huge clouds of glass fibers. I don't have an acceptable answer to give you. Because no matter what you do, it's going to lead to a problem. And if you do decide to remove it, you've got to handle the job like an asbestos abatement project. And that means, that means bringing in fans. It's not really that big a deal, actually. You bring in a big fan in the front door. You inflate the living area with massive, massive, overwhelming positive pressure so that every little sink drain and crack in the floor is blasting air downwards. And then you find some kind of escape hatch from the cellar, and you have that, and all this air shipped out that way. And then you really get busy with spray bottles. <laughs> it needs to be water. And you scrub the whole thing and capture as, as much of the plastic resin and the loose fiber from the fiberglass as you can into buckets. And you throw that out. A, I shouldn't make it clear. Asbestos is not a, a digestible, I'm sorry, fiberglass is not a digestible hazard. It's a breathing hazard. So if you soak it down and you suppress the breathing hazard, it's safe to work with. Um, but this, this is a job. So do you suggest that a radiant pipe's copper tubing not be insulated in that situation? OK. You tell me. Did I, did I give you enough information to, to make a wise decision? I don't know. I have too much history with the whole thing, so it's hard to... No, but that, that's, no, that, that's, a, that's a kind of feedback. No, I haven't. I haven't. The, the, the thing is, um, I don't like the idea of fiberglass inside houses. All right? I'm not real keen on it anywhere. But at least if it's in the attic, look, just, I know this isn't your problem and it's not even our topic, but let's go there anyway. Is there a big issue health-wise of putting fiberglass in an attic? Thank you. That's right. Why? Because the positive pressure is here and anything that gets loose is going to get flushed out the roof. You never see any insulation coming back in the house. Never. Unless, unless you start monkeying with the ductwork. But speaking of which, I do have to get to a couple things. Um, this is now going to become a floor. And I've, have I lost? Oh, here's, here's my cell. OK. Now, this is a pretty realistic model of a floor over a block foundation. And for our purposes, it could be a cement foundation. But you know, this is all flush. The only difference is that this would have another piece of two by material encapsulating that and some siding to decorate it. But for our purposes, I left it open so that you can see. Here's something really safe you can do. You can get another trash bag. And you can put some stuff in it. Now, the last time I did this, I used fiberglass for this demonstration, and I made myself sick. And that's why I had strong words for you. I've made myself stick with the stinking stuff just doing a demonstration. I was coughing for a week. That's all I could do. I'm using my sleeping bag this time. <laughs> Whatever you got. Bubble wrap. Spare bags. Old sweaters. Whatever. All you do is just munch it in there. And you can pack it pretty good when there's 
something to resist. And if you're getting paid, you tuck in the corners so it looks nice, and you're done. Now, the point is that, you know, this little area right in here, that's part of the envelope. And it gets cold there, and it deserves to be insulated. And here's a, here's a really cheap, simple, harmless way to do it. All right? It does block some air. And the, the, that's why I say use, use cheesy bags to do it, because they conform a little bit better to the, to the joist. When you punch it right in there, you, you, you cover up a lot of stuff. But you don't do it so well as to allow a vacuum to develop. The point is you can buy some spray foam and just hose that whole area down so it's essentially injection molding blocks all the way through. And if you had an ACE crew who certified that they had brought the top of the building to an airtight state, I couldn't argue against that measure. But these, you know, these are rare, rare. You, you, have to, you have to hire a really, really good guy to do that. Um, you know, not some knucklehead. Um, you know, somebody who's really set up, not only to do, know how to do the work, but can verify that he's done it effectively through, through instrumentation and pressure testing. Um, my point is, why bother? You know, the banjo, it's a, it's a significant part of the house. And it, I've been convinced through the years that leaving it bare is not a good thing. It deserves some insulation. And, um, you know, if you wear a mask and you, and you do it outside, you can, you can take a roll of fiberglass, cut it into chunks, get a feel for how much is a good amount, stuff it in the bag, seal it up, and then, you know, cart a dozen of them under your arm downstairs, punch them in. You can't barely do any harm, and it's a valid conservation method. Sir? Uh, my question is, it seems like there's different levels. You mentioned if you could sort of vacuum seal it and they blow in the foam and so on. I mean, that's probably the best of, of the options. That being the most simple and inexpensive of the options, using the, the bag and the, the sleeping, you know, stuffing something in there. If you had access to blue board or some other sort of foam board, you can close up in that space and then maybe seal it up with... Uh, Done that many, many times. I cannot recommend it to untrained non-professionals. When we did that work for utilities, we were required on every single project to go through an agonizing combustion safety protocol. So that before we left that house, we were measuring the time to draft, the flu temperature, the, the combustion gases, and, and documenting all this be, because the utility knew that if they went crazy on these measures, they'd get million dollar lawsuits. And the reason they knew this is because it happens all the time. I can't recommend to folks doing that measure. And I'm going to do this once again. Here's what happens if you don't do it. Here's what happens if you don't spend all that money and risk all that safety. Sorry, I had the cap open. <laughs> Nothing happens. There's no payoff. Do the work that counts. Put all of your effort into the top of the building. I promise you, scientifically, verifiably true, you will get credit for sealing the cellar for every bit of effort you do in the, in the attic. Can you deal with the issue of wet basements a little more? Um, you're saying to put down the plastic in crawl spaces and like the two tough on the floor. I did skimp on that. Thank you. There are two types of issues in moisture in basements. There's the really nasty thing that you can see, which are puddles. And then there's the invisible diffusion through the surfaces. Maybe it's sand. Maybe it's even porous concrete that you can't see, that never bothers you. The point is, P3 
people get bad, bad, bad troubles in their attics in our climate from condensation. And all of that water comes from the cellar, 99% of it. You know, you hear all the time about issues with washing clothes and bathing and bath fans and all this. It, it never comes to more than 4% of the water load on the house. Uh, the fact is, if you have moisture problems in the attic, they won't ever end until you treat the cellar with one of those products or you, 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 you put down some plastic and then pour concrete on it. But the fact is, you've got to have that. Now, right here, here's an illustrative story. Right here in Middlebury, I did a job for a lady. And it's not the most interesting story because she wasn't getting killed and her family was all happy and everything. But the paint was flying off her house. And that was annoying to her. First diagnostic in a paint failure issue is, is it happening on all sides of the building? Because if it is, it's not weather. You know the moisture is coming from the inside if you see paint failures up and down all around. It's a very simple diagnostic. So we go down into her cellar, and if I had to name this, I would call it the, the, the little dehumidifier who couldn't. Beautiful gravel basement. Somebody had worked on it. And there was a stand with a dehumidifier, and there was a donut <laughs> around the dehumidifier where the rock was a shade lighter. <laughs> it was beautiful. You could see that the impact of dehumidification from this device was tragic. I mean, laughable. But when you look across the cellar and see that the furnace had been fitted with a central humidifier, <laughs> yes. I mean, that's, that's what it just gets to be, you know, weatherization. <laughs> that's the word I was searching for. Yes, people do spend money on electricity on machines that cancel themselves out, sir. Yeah, um, I just wanted to mention that I, I spent 40 years uh, as a mason doing concrete work and brick work and everything. So I have a pretty good feel for what happens to a, when I see a concrete foundation. And I've been fixing them. Um, and I find the biggest problem is once in a while you'll find a, a house with no concrete floor and you got and you just went over that. It's a huge problem. But otherwise, um, aside from the occasional house that needs a, a sump pump because the water table is up too high, if the water table is not up that high, you see cracks. Very often you see cracks in concrete or uh, concrete block uh -huh. foundations. Or effervescence. Yeah, the uh, white powder that starts accumulating like little stalactites. Yeah, if if things are not right, sometimes the water can just wick its way through, and you got a damp foundation. Yeah, but no puddles. Right. But when you have these cracks, and it's so common, I find that these cracks can be fixed in a matter of an hour or two. Hmm? And once you fix the crack, then you don't have these puddles on the water on the floor anymore, and that's a huge source of, um, this is what I find anyway. No, no, I, I was supposed to be addressing this when I got sidetracked. Yeah, I figured. The, the two types of water intrusion we see in foundations, the bulk liquid water pouring in that everybody gets hysterical about, and the invisible diffusion of water through the surfaces. Now, having met me tonight, which do you think I'm going to tell you is more important. Between two things, one being? Uh, being liquid water pouring in or water diffusing invisibly by evaporating off the surface of these areas. In, in, invisible, you know. Yeah. When people get a leak, they clean it up. It's episodic. Boom. You get a puddle. <clears throat> it gets sponged up. Problem over. When you've got dirt and it can be looking like dry sand, 
That baby is delivering water night and day, every single day through the whole year. Yep. Up to 20 gallons, excuse me, 20 pounds a day from a you know, half, half crawl space. And you know, when I get the call, what happens is that we, we have a cold snap. Well, this is like in the old days before global warming when it got cold. We'd see like 20, 30 below for a stretch. All right? I used to live outside of Montpelier. It got real cold there. So this moisture like, flowed up there day after day after day. Strike the rafters and the roof deck, condense and freeze. And it will build up hundreds, if not thousands of pounds of frost. Then the weather will break. We get an inch of snow, and people are telling me, my roof is leaking. <laughs> and you look said, no, there's, there's not enough water on your roof to cause a leak. What happens is that 1,000 pounds of frost melts overnight, and it looks exactly like a roof leak. I only had one instance in Bridport where that came from standing water. One time, and I was like the only guy advertising for attic condensation problems in Vermont. This guy had, you know, he had a pond in his cellar. And, you know, when I got there, the, the place looked like a refugee center. They had every pot they had on the floor, and, and, and the, the family was huddled up on the couch. I mean, it was like raining. I wished I had an umbrella to go into their house. I got soaked. But I can tell you, in practice, you get much, much, much more problem from invisible water than from the bulk leaks. But I don't want to discount your point because, you know, a healthy foundation is a sound foundation. You know, if, if, if you've got, if, if you're looking at problems like this when, you know, the wall's bowing in and stuff, snakes, rodents, that's no good. You know, that, that's, that's one of the things that attracted me to this, is that these passageways don't just facilitate the loss of heat, but every stinking other problem, moisture, toxins, soil gas, mold, snakes, mice, frogs, you know, it, it never ends. Plus, here's the big one. If, you weren't talking about foundations, but if these gaps occur in the, in the wood frame of the house, now you have fire passages on top of everything else. No good. Healthy structures are sound structures, and sound means no holes. That's why I learned to find holes in buildings. Because you, you fix a hole, and it's, you, you're not just solving the problem that the client was asking you to deal with. You're, you're, you're addressing like a whole range of stuff they never knew was going on in the first place. You know, nobody ever taught, called me to fix a mouse problem, but I fixed a lot of them. <laughs> Sir. I wanted to ask about the, uh, is this live? Yes. Um, the, the proportion of invisible water that coming into a basement, I have a very wet basement, uh, half of it's dirt, half of it's cracked concrete. We got puddles quite a bit or near a river, um, but uh, I like the idea of putting the cross-linked uh, polyethylene down on all the floor Just areas. don't walk on it. Yeah, or use the rubber roofing. Right. And, um, but the uh, ground line is about four and a half, five feet. You can look out the little high windows and there's the ground there. So do I have to put that stuff, hang it around the entire perimeter, or is that a who's, minor who's portion? Who's got that rubber sample? I need that back. Um, I have, I did several projects for the Shelburne Museum, which had the same thing. You could look out one of their basement window, and you were at pond level, <laughs> okay? And they wanted to use the space in the cellar of one of their antique buildings for uh, storage and archival stuff that, you know, was moisture sensitive. They wanted me to dry it out. 
in that case, what we do, I just wanted to show you this technique. This is wonderful stuff to use. You, you go across the floor, you tip it up, and I'd leave it kind of like that. So if a dribble ever came down the wall, it gets stuffed under there and go back outdoors. You don't have to clad the entire wall. Well, depends on your customer. That's me. If, if, if they're running around, if, if you get some guy who, who's got a hygrometer measuring the humidity in the building 24 hours a day, there's no place to run. You gotta, you gotta create some results. <laughs> and we would take that, that polyurethane product Cleat it down to the, um, to the sill and then let it drape. You know, we, we, again, you know, trying to be workmen about it, we would get that baby smooth as glass going down there so it looked like work. Is, nope, nobody wants, you know, like shower curtains, you know, hanging around their cellar. And if you're asking people to pay money for the work, you got to do a beautiful job, and it, I'm here to tell you it's, it's hard to make this look pretty hanging down a cellar wall. But we did it, and we got paid. <laughs> uh, my real question is what percent of the water in the, in the case I described is going to be coming in? Fair enough. Uh, through the walls, and what percent? Do, do the math. Just the square footage. Uh... Integrate the wall area? Yeah. And contrast it, oops, sorry, with the floor area. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a level up here. Look at the ratio. You'll probably find out that in most cellars, they're pretty close. All right, I haven't done that calculation in a while, but it seemed to me like if you had like a 20, uh, 24 by 36, you know, Cape Cod style house, you were getting pretty close to equal floor to wall. Oh, I figure, yeah, okay. You know? Uh, close enough to sneeze at anyway. If now you, you go a step further and you assume that all of these surfaces are fully saturated, then it's safe to assume they have the same gotcha. delivery rate. Okay. And base your, base your, uh, your, you know, uh, your plans on that. But the other thing too is, you know, work to solve problems. Now, you know, the other side of this is there have been people who have gone into crawl spaces, you know, really gun ho dry that baby out, and they destroyed the house. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you take a house that's been built and fully saturated for a decade, and you go up there and do a NASA-style job on that cellar one day, and all of a sudden... <laughs> Every single stick in that whole house is, is going to drop, uh, uh, you know, 5% in its moisture content. You're, you're looking at, like, flying sheetrock. <laughs> um, you, you know, uh, you, you can, I mean, you know, floors will buckle. Uh, cabinets will, will start leaning off walls. Um, so I, I would tell you to ease in. Okay. To a problem. And, and solve a problem. Don't make a sport out of it. You know, if, if you've got symptoms you want to fix, go ahead and do the work that takes care of that to make your house do that stuff. But don't do work. Don't do anything that doesn't improve those conditions. Just don't do it. So, if you, if you slather down that material on the floor, do the easy job, pick the low-hanging fruit, and then you run out of symptoms, declare victory. Thanks. Sir, up oh, me. Thank you. Um, our basement, I, I would characterize it as wet, all right, but um, it does have periodic puddles, and yes, they can be sponged up. Um, but one of the one out of the four walls, about halfway down its length, on the inside has a black kind of mold discoloration. That's not good. No, no, it's not good. Um, I've Cloroxed it twice. Good. 
but I'm wondering how I should treat it. Should I try and simply cover it? Let's talk about that. Thank you. you do you know where the water's coming from? No, don't go away. Oh, do I know? No. No, however, I did find that when I sloped extra dirt up against the wall, it... Inside or outside? Outside, uh -huh. sorry. Outside, it, it's a, it, it's a, it cut it back incredibly. All right, here's step two. You get some more stuff. Mm. I happen to like this. This costs a dollar, that other stuff costs 10 cents. You roof your foundation. You go drag six, four, six inches of soil, six, eight feet away from the foundation, you know, in the trouble area. You get some of this stuff, you just throw it down on the ground. You work it up the wall so that, you know, you, you don't want to do this and, you know, have water sneak on that edge. You can just build yourself a, a quick little curb, throw some dirt over that, give it the right grade so you're shoving the water away from the building, problem over. Total victory. And I was going to make this point, thank you, it's so helpful to get good questions like that. Um, you know, the other, the other thing I wanted to address at some point here was, you know, people get bowing walls, cracked walls, and all that. And, um, you know, those represent problems, because I just don't like holes in houses. Um, so you're on the outside, I'm on the inside, and the wall's starting to do this. Well, what to do? Well, the first thing to do is understand what's happening. A lot of people used to think that this was frost action. They told these stories about, it didn't really make a whole lot of sense, but they told stories that lenses of ice were forming laterally and pushing. And everybody said, well, if it's put, why wouldn't it push straight up where there's no resistance? And there was never any answers for that. Finally, uh, a buddy of mine at the University of Illinois decided to tackle this problem because he just couldn't stand it anymore. Here's what he discovered. Soil around the foundation goes through periodic wetting and drying cycles. When it dries, it shrinks, and it pulls away from the foundation a little bit. When that happens, little trickles of soil scoot down that gap all the way down to the footing. Then it goes through another soaking cycle, expands, another drying cycle, and more crumbs start falling down there. This has a ratcheting effect, and this is the true reason why foundations buckle. Material keeps being added to this gap through every moisture cycle, and it just keeps pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing until finally some part of the masonry structure snaps. Once that happens, you're in a pickle. And this gentleman would probably give you better advice on that. However, if you want to stop the trauma or you know, keep it from happening in the first place, grading the soil is you know, the historically sound advice to do that. But what happens when you get into one of these city streets where the lots are like tiered so that like one house is like dumping water off its roof right down to the foundation of the next one. That's when you're obliged to go to a technique like this. Because by simply burying a membrane, you can now create a, a low-tech subterranean gutter. And you can make that water go anywhere you want, as long as you make gravity your friend. You just send this baby downhill a little bit, a quarter inch per foot or less, and the water goes where you want, and the soil up against the foundation doesn't go through these wetting and drying cycles to such extremes. And so the gap opening and closing contracts, and everything gets better. So my point is grading, like I said, 
uh, always, always a sound idea. When you're really in a pickle, augment the grating with a membrane, and then it's bomb proof. I got to do one more thing. I promise I'll answer your question, but our time is getting short, and I must do this project. Because we've talked about ducks and ducks and ducks, and it's time to deal with it. Again, if you have a hydronic system, you're going to get out of a lot of trouble. If you have forced air, you have to deal with it. Now, the standard for building ductwork is airtight. And <laughs> it's the interpretation that's a problem. To every heating contractor on the planet, this looks airtight to them. It's not. All right. If they were held to the same standard as plumbers, they'd be in jail. All right. There's no pretending that 99% that of the duct installations are leaking. And I want to highlight this measure. I want to make sure we fit this in. Because um, it's, this is really easy. And personally, I think it's fun. When we had these jobs, I would take it away from my crew because uh, I always wanted to do it. <laughs> um, because you get a cotton glove and you buy some of this stuff. It's waterborne so you don't kill yourself. Sometimes it had to actually climb inside the ductwork. And you don't want toxic mastic with the inside of a duct. Um, this stuff is just wonderful. You take a gob of it and you got to wear cotton gloves because all these parts are sharp. And I'll do it this way so you can see what I'm doing. You just sort of have fun. <laughs> uh, I could, I could bury. I, I had, I had really moral qualms about even charging for this work. <laughs> I enjoyed it so much. Um, there. That wasn't so bad. Now we have a NASA grade seal on this joint. Problem over. But I want to tell you about the baby that dodged the ceiling. Some folks called me up in the Berkshires, Massachusetts, and um, I really didn't want to bring my crew down to Massachusetts and stay in hotels and pay for their meals, but they wouldn't take no for an answer. And then I found out why. The baby had a crib and a nursery room, and they picked the baby up one night, and while they were downstairs, the ceiling fell down right into the kid's crib. Oh, yes. <laughs> I had the best job in the world. <laughs> There, there were thousands of things wrong with this, with this building. Um, and I'm just going to tell you about one of them. Downstairs, there's a, there's a duct that kind of looked like this, more or less. And um, at some point, they wanted to have another phone line put into the kitchen. Now, for young people, phone line is like an old-style DSL modem. All right. It was an ancient communication device that people used in their homes. And the wall, the, the, the sad part was that the wall upstairs was like right on top of this duct. And the installer thought, well, that's not a bad thing. I'll just like rip a hole in it and drill the wire through. Job over. <laughs> Twelve years later, I come to this, this house with the, with, the, with the plaster in the crib, and this flap is still hanging in here. All right? So what, what's going on? We got the cellar. We got, we got the furnace down here. And, and, we're, um, and we're really, really, really hoping 
that while we're burning fuel, all those gases are going to somehow magically go up the ceiling. I'm sorry, up the, up the chimney. Well, what happens now when you get one of these giant sucking machines and somebody cuts a hole like this in the return duct right next to the furnace? Do you think that this three horsepower motor, highly engineered air handling system is going to be more or less powerful than this gravity operated flu? Bonus question. What happens if some knucklehead says, let's seal the cellar up? All right? The, the air handlers in these furnaces, especially the older ones, are like unbelievably powerful. They will completely overwhelm the chimney. These, these things can, can develop you know, hundreds of pascals of pressure. And you're, you know, on its best day, this flu might give you 10. That's, your life is hanging on 10 pascals on its best day. And then you've got knuckleheads coming around, chopping holes in the ductwork willy-nilly, with, with not even the faintest idea of what they're doing. So when you get a big hole, you can, you can slop some, another piece of sheet metal on it. Or if you're like really cheap like me, you get a little leftover mixed tape and you know, maybe it'd help to put a screw in there to hold it. Or you could just slobber on a little extra. <laughs> um, point is, how long did that take me to fix? Done. All right. That one defect, what was that, 30 seconds? Over, over, um, you know, the life of the furnace could pay off two, three thousand dollars worth of energy savings. But do we even care when a kid is getting clobbered with ceiling plaster? Do we care about these shekels? No, we do not. The kid could have been killed. How many centuries will it take? for the energy efficiency to be worth the price of a baby. There isn't enough time in our son's life to equal that. That's my message to you. Call me if you have, if you have questions, but do this stuff and the building will take care of that without you even thinking about it. That's, I had to do that. Now, those questions that I cut you off. Well, I was, it was actually a follow-up on her question where you were telling her to put the rubber around the exterior of the foundation. Yes. I have a situation, a 120-year-old house, stone foundation with a porch all the way around it that yep. I can't get under. Oh, come on. Well, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've sent crews okay. through two by sixes. Where's this? You see this? <laughs> I put people in spaces like this. Yeah, but, <laughs> but wait a minute. Let me, let me finish my question. Okay. Let me finish my question. The, the water is coming off the roof. Does it make any sense to put the rubber on the outside where the where the porch? Well, the answer lies in the building itself. If there isn't any trouble, then there's no need for a solution. On the other hand, if you look at this area of your foundation, it's adjacent to that porch, and it shows trouble with water intrusion, or bulging, or efflorescence, then yeah, there is a problem that you need to address. The, the, the thing, I wish we had more time. Stone foundations 
are, are, are touchy because there's, you're limited into what you can do with them. You know, half the time, the soil around the stones are, are what's providing the structure to the things. If you try to push them around or, or, or get frisky with them, you know, you can cause a disaster. And my solution has been to, dry, to, to isolate them. You know, if, if there's water pouring in there, to get it to go somewhere else. And, you know, you know un unless we did an engineering trip to your, to your cellar, I would tell you, let the building give you the answers. If you see a symptom, hunt for the problem. Well, I know it's even more simple than that. I know water's getting in, and I know the house is downhill from Route 7, and the water comes right off Route 7 and drains into my cellar. Intersect it. Put in some other kind of drainage system and cut it off and make it go somewhere else. Like drain tile outside. French, French, uh, French drain. Excavate a slot. Throw in a pipe or not. Fill it with washed stone. Give it an, a filter envelope so it doesn't clog with soil. Cover it over. Problem solved. And then not not mess around with the plastic on the stone walls. No, no. You know, I've, I've done these jobs, and it's always amazing when I cut through the soil and see what's going on underground. Generally, the water is not oozing through a mass of soil. What we usually see is like a lump of clay and another lump of clay and then a vein of gravel between them. And that gravel runs night and day. And this is why, you know, sometimes surface measures don't work. Because you've actually got an underground network of freely moving water and a gravel layer delivering right to the foundation wall. Now, the monsters who build, you know, when they excavate the, for the original building, they could see this, and they don't do anything other than, you know, somebody else is stuck with it. But that's the answer, is if, is if you can determine that this isn't a surface issue, then dig until you find the porous layer of earth that's providing the channel for this. Cut it off. Make it go somewhere else. Oh. oh, no, no, I was just, just thinking about that. Oh. I'm sorry, we, we're, time is limited. I, I, let me ask a question to do with your mastic then. Um, does that, this same old house has a furnace in one place and then it has a long, almost horizontal stovepipe hooking, over, hooking over to the old furnace, to is the old a, chimney? Is, is this a flue pipe or a round duct? Round, round exhaust pipe okay, from, the, from, the, right. from the combustion. Right. Um, would it be wise to put something like that mastic no. around every? No, 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 no. No. It's hot. Right. Number one. Number two, flue pipes, when they're operating correctly with a chimney that's drafting, always have negative pressure in them. So when they leak, and they always leak, the leak is from clean house air inward to the pipe. That's your safety. You don't want to ever address a back drafting problem by attempting to seal the flu system, because you can't. If it doesn't leak, like I should have mentioned, if you got if you got a flue pipe, this is this is something you should inspect for in the cellar. If you've got a flue pipe and there's black soot seeming to jet out of the gaps through the through the field joints, that means it's backdrafting intermittently. You want to address those issues. 
by coming to the next session. <laughs> and, and because that's a symptom, OK? It's a nasty symptom. But the flue pipe isn't forcing the combustion gases out. It's the attic that's doing it. And I can't tell you that story tonight because there isn't time. Uh, I, I'm wondering if just opening the windows upstairs would have the same effect as a, as a leaky attic. Yes, yes. Also, what would you do if you, if you, you know, something happened? This, well, this happened to me once. Um, we, we moved into an old house, and I didn't know much. And as it turned out, we just fired up the furnace willy-nilly, and I discovered that the flue pipe had been corroded. And, I mean, there was, you know, like a basket or a baseball size hole in it and smoke was coming out. Open the cellar window. Because if you've got a problem with a flu backdrafting, it means that there's negative pressure in here with respect to the outdoors. If you open a window, that all goes away instantly. Because now you've got a big passage, and the, the combustion zone becomes pressure neutral, and the draft kicks right in. The same with a fireplace. You've seen it. Yep. I just want to ask a question about the sill joists again, because in doing um, a lot of home visits, I saw fiberglass stuffed into the sill joists, very common, and it had that brown paper backing that had become moldy. Um, so I hear. Moldy, you say? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> because I guess, you know, like the moisture is conducting through the cement block anyway, and the fiberglass is not stopping it because it's not a vapor barrier. So it's getting trapped there, you know, and it's getting caught in the brown paper over time and creates mold on the brown paper. More backing. likely. Let me, let me just, I'm going to interrupt you a minute and, and, and give you a more likely scenario. Behind the fiberglass, there, in here, Okay. Now we've got stuffing all in here, but it's not airtight. It's craft and it's not fitting tight. So moisture is free to permeate this area, but the air, the, the wall in back of the fiberglass is cold. Mm -hmm. So it's condensing there. It looks it just like this area is attracting the water like a magnet. What's really happening is the water is pinging all over every place, but when it pings off, a, it hits a cold surface, it doesn't go away, it sticks. So now you probably get a chunk of frost build up in that area, and then one fine day the weather breaks and it all melts and it gets wet. Well, that's why I, I thought you really wanted to make that tight and... No. You don't want no. to make it. The, the, um, um, our language has a lot of metaphors for this. Letting the cat out of the bag, open can of worms, Pandora's box. Once you allow excessive amounts of moisture into the house, You'll go from one symptom to the next symptom to the next symptom. It will never end because you never address the problem. And the problem is the source of moisture, not where it exhibits a symptom. So what's happening now is these, these band joists are behaving like dehumidifiers for you. It's exactly like a dehumidifier. It's a chilled surface capturing the moisture. If you stop that from capturing the moisture, the moisture isn't captured. So it's going to find the next cold surface to condense on. Maybe your windows will start running. I had a client who asked me to fix icicles. He had this problem and this problem, 
but he said he only had enough money to hire me to do this problem. I said, well, okay, it's $400 to cover your dirt floor down there, but if you say you're going to do it, you got to promise me you're going to do it. He, oh, yeah, I'll do it. And six weeks later, when it turned cold, he called me up and he had mold on the side of his refrigerator. And I said, I guaranteed to you that this would happen. Rivers running down his windows. I said, I guaranteed it. The point is, this didn't happen before because all the air was exiting the building. I stopped that to save his roof. He hired me to treat the symptom. And I said, well, that's fine as long as you'd agree to tackle the problem. And when he didn't, he just got a new batch of symptoms. And that's, that's the only thing I, I can give you, is that once you let too much water loose in a house, it's going to give you trouble. you got to get a hold of it and suppress it, keep it outdoors. Fred, I... I'm still confused about the moisture problem in the basement. You gave us two solutions to put the rubberized or the or the um, the other plastic. Build down. an envelope. Does it have? To, it, you said it didn't have to be sealed. Just lay it down, and if it's there's a little gap, you're getting 97 percent anyway. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And it's because of the area you're covering is stop. You're stopping the evaporation from that. Diffusion is strictly proportional to surface area. Okay, so if you have water coming in on the slab and you put your channels so it all goes to a drain, but still you got wetness there that's evaporating, you should still put a um, rubberized well, surface uh, again, down? Well, again, try, try this effect. All right. Honest to goodness. Inside? I, that's inside. That's now. inside. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying... Like around the perimeter. Because the water's still coming in. There's a channel do down there that you're trying to capture and divert down to a drain. Right. So now I don't have a whole floor wet. I just have little channels going to yeah. it where it's draining. But I'm still getting moisture coming in. Yeah. And I can't stop that because of, of the outside. I, I problem. understand. But uh, you, I yeah. should still put the rubber vapor barrier or whatever well, you want. Well, try this. Get, get a hold of some cheesy plastic. 10 by 10, 12 by 12. It's got a, you know, good, don't, don't chintz on this. Pretend it's this. This is like a small model. Lay it down on the floor. Get a rug or boxes or something and put it on top so it marries it down to the surface. You've got to squeeze it down hard so the air isn't scooting under there. Leave it for a week. Roll it up. If you've got beads of water under there, you know you've got to deal with that. Because the area is so large in the floor that that invisible diffusion may eclipse the amount of water you're actually seeing in the dribbles. But the point is, don't guess. The, the worst measurement is better than the best guess. So test. I mean, this is a stupid, it, you know, it's, it's, it's not quantifiable. You throw it down and you, and you let it develop. And it's yes or no. Is there water there or not? And there's your answer. You don't, you don't, have, to, you don't have to wonder anymore. So if there is water there, then you need to do the whole basement. Thank you very much, Fred. We really appreciate your presentation. We're done. Thank you. <laughs> and our next program is going to be December 8th. Thank you. Thank you very much.